Good morning. So today we're going to add to our lecture series with some a look at some of the other important parts of our watershed, some of the issues, some of the practices, sustainable practices that we can implement in our watershed. So today we're, we've covered this a little bit, but wastewater treatment, obviously wastewater treatment is huge because um, if we can mimic nature, mimic the hydrological si cycle, we can recycle a lot of a water. And that's an area that here in the Mojave that we've actually done a really good job of. For years, we've been recycling and reusing wastewater by sending it on down the river to Barstow. Recently, we've built two wastewater recovery plants, uh, secondary treatment, uh, actually yeah, secondary treatment in Hesperia and Apple Valley to catch the water there and then send it out on what's called purple pipes. Recycled water, not drinkable, not potable, as we call drinkable water, goes back out on lawns and landscapes, parks, golf courses, that kind of thing. Without all the energy being wasted of going all the way down to Atalanto, uh, Oro Grande, actually, we'll be visiting that on our field trip, the main wastewater treatment plant, Victor Valley Waste Reclamation Authority. It's a collaborative, a special district, a special kind of government entity where it's Apple Valley, Victorville, Hesperia. I think those are the three main ones in some county areas all work together to treat our waste together. But that's way downstream. So if we treat the water down there to drinkable or just to recyclable onto landscapes, it has to be pumped all the way back up to us up here with a lot of use of energy if we're going to reuse it. So it makes more sense to reclaim it down there. Okay, we're also going to look at gray water and rainwater harvesting. Two really cute, cool little things that we can do um, to start being better water conservationists. So, see if that'll work. Why does that not want to work today? Oh, just turn it on. Okay, wastewater treatment. Um, what's the purpose? To manage water discharge from homes, businesses, and industries to reduce the threat of water pollution. Okay, so pretty simple. Um, description of what it is. We, we want to reduce the water pollution, but then I was just talking about we want to reuse that water. We've got to reuse that water. Um, you know, just think about we're using drinkable water right now to flush our toilets. I don't think we're going to have the luxury of doing that in the future. We're going to have to be a bit smarter than that. Okay, Wastewater treatment, it includes pre-treatment, preliminary treatment, primary treatment, secondary treatment, tertiary treatment, and then sludge or biosolids disposals. How do we get rid of the, what's called the biosolids, what's left over from, from the treatment? Um, Pre-treatment often occurs at the business or at the, at the industry. It's to prevent stuff getting in that's toxic. I think in one of the lectures I gave the example of the, of the dry cleaning house that businesses was putting some of their solvents into the water late at night. That's pre-treatment. Let's not put it in there before we even get started. So we also always apply this, this principle of pollution that almost always it's way more, way cheaper to prevent something to go in, going in a pollutant than to treat it. Very hard to get it out once, it, once it's in there and also very expensive. Okay? Water discharges from homes, businesses, industry and enters sanitary sewers. Okay, so this is actually why we actually take people to the sewage plant. You're like, man, that's really nasty. Why would you do that? Well, we need to understand what happens with our waste. We're a, we're a throwaway, wasteful uh, society. And if we don't understand what happens to the waste and what it takes to treat that waste, I don't really think we really think about things like how much water are we just going to run down our sh in our shower to go down there to get thrown in with all the other water that has to get treated? Because by the time it gets there, it's polluted, right? Um, rainwater on the streets comes in from our stormwater sewers. But what happens is when it, by the time it gets to the sewage treatment plant, these two combine. The sewage and the rainwater uh, from stormwater actually combine. 
Okay, so just a real quick point about stormwater. Stormwater is also a very cool little career field. Uh, I think the city of Asperia employs two stormwater control people that go out there and regulate stormwater uh, issues. Right, uh, water moves towards the wastewater plant by gravity flow. Okay, for us, it actually goes from us here, from Asperia, from Apple Valley, goes in these big pipes um, and actually goes through the narrows right now. A couple of years ago, we had a really interesting situation, not so fun for Victor Valley Wastewater Reclam Reclamation Authority, VVWRA, but um, the pipes actually came up out of the ground, out of the, out of the floor of the river. They actually, uh, they're submerged, obviously, subsurface, and they got pushed up. That's because of the floods. The floods got in underneath them, they, they made the water muddy and, and the pipes actually lifted up, caused a huge sewerage spill. I'm going to say this is about 10 years ago now. And actually, no, it wasn't. It's about in the early 2000s, about eight years ago. And um, so VVWR had to pay huge fines. They since have taken those pipes out of the river and they flow through the narrows. If you don't do this while you're driving, but if you look over the Narrows Bridge as you go over Highway 18, you'll see big pipes going along next to the railroad line, and that's the sewerage pipes now. What they're going to do is drill a hole right through the hill there at the Narrows and, and, and send it straight through the hill on down to the sewerage plant. So they don't have to put it in that very vulnerable area because, yeah, they polluted the river, but it's, that's an also very, very sensitive, important habitat. Again, we'll be stopping very start of our trip, May 1st. Don't forget to sign your field trip forms on our two-day trip. We'll be stopping at the Lewis Center, at the Narrows, in that wetland riparian area. That's a very critical habitat, very important uh, piece of our ecology up here. Okay? So here's a picture. I hope you can see it. Um, not going to go in great detail here because we're going to go through the parts. You'll get to visit this. You don't have to become an expert on sewerage treatment, but basically incoming raw sewerage goes through a grit chamber, takes the grit out, a sedimentation tank that allows all the heavy stuff to settle out. That is taken off to a digester where they put air with it and it, it digests it. it. It decomposes it using bacteria in that. The dry, we're talking the dry stuff, what's called the biosolids or the sludge. This can go out in sludge drying beds, and then they either go onto agricultural land. They're obviously up, uh, often composted before they go out. Um, the composting site that we're going to visit right next to VVWRA takes some of that biosolids and combines it with the green waste, all the yard waste and that kind of stuff that they're getting from LA, and they put in a compost that can go out in agriculture. Obviously tremendously better solution because we're getting all those nutrients back into our food as much as people turn their noses and say, well, it's, it was originally human sewerage. Well, by the time it's treated and tested, there's really no chance of any contamination from it. But that's a much better way than putting it out on the landfills. And we'll see in a moment, that's not allowed anymore. You can't put it out on the landfills. What happens in the landfills is it turns to methane. And methane is a 25 times, not 25%, 25 times. So 25 times more potent greenhouse causing gas. In other words, it, it holds in the, the ultra, ultra uh, uh, I was, I'm saying ultraviolet, but uh, infrared rays of the sun. So it, it, it forms a better glass canopy, as it were, for green, as a greenhouse gas. It's 25 times stronger, better at doing that, if you want to put it that way, than carbon dioxide. Okay, um, the rest of it is just going to keep going. And eventually, I'm sorry, eventually it comes here and we put air into it. This is the biological process. Primary treatment, secondary treatment. We'll going to talk about that in a moment. When that's all biologically digested, most people, I think, in cities believe that the sewage is treated with chemicals. No, it's not. It's treated with bugs and bacteria. Really cool. Actually, a fun thing to work in because you're, you're actually 
other than the smell. Uh, you guys will have to, you'll have to get used to that. But, but um, you're dealing with a biological process, a living ecosystem. And, and a good sewerage operation team basically manages an ecosystem, keeps it healthy. And we'll talk about that when we get to the sewerage treatment plant. And then finally, we discharge the water out, either into rivers, lakes, and oceans. We talked in our first lecture about how I think it's really criminal in this day and age, but lots of LA sewerage from the big Hyperion plant, for example, in LA, goes straight out in the ocean before being treated to the tertiary stage. Remember I talked about primary, secondary, and tertiary. Tertiary is that final stage that actually treats it to drinking water standards. So um, they won't do it for liability reasons, but at, when you're at the plant, you could literally, here in, Apple, here in Victorville, you could actually drink that water. So um, they, they don't do that because of, of liability reasons, but you could. Okay, um, so real quick now, we're gonna run through the actual process, primary treatment, large objects come out, there's bar screens, there's a grit chamber that take out all the large stuff, all the stuff that shouldn't go down your toilet in the first place, right? Um, and it protects the pumps uh, and the equipment from damage. Things can get clogged up. Um, these new sanitary wipes, not, I'm not talking about female sanitary wipes, I'm talking about the ones that you get these days um, are a really big problem because many of them are not biodegradable. So rather than toilet paper, using these, these disinfectant wipes, those are a really big problem at the sewage treatment plant. They just clog things up. So they have to, for example, have to be taken out. There's a bar screen, you'll get to see one of these, kind of nasty, it's got all kinds of stuff. Stuff gets pulled off there, bottles, pieces of wood, uh, engagement ring once in, a, once in a while. They were telling us once about big, beautiful engagement ring that the guys found down there that was worth several thousand dollars that comes off in, in the stuff because you know things can get dropped down the toilet by mistake. Okay, then there's a grit chamber, get, grabs the rocks and the gravel, a mesh screen, plastic bags, towels, syringes, just crazy stuff that people just throw down the toilet because they don't understand that doing that creates a big, big problem for everyone. Okay, there's just a quick graphic of it happening. Uh, measure and sampling at the end of the structure. So this is really important. Very, very scientific system here. Um, what, we're, what we're talking about here is we, the sewage treatment plant will, needs to sample when the sludge, the, the sewage gets to the plant. They're going to be looking for two main things. They're going to be looking for suspended solids and they're going to be looking for biological oxygen demand. This is basically the amount of nutrients is in that, that water, so it tells them how much biological activity they're going to have to have to digest that. So if it's a very thick, rich, lots of nutrients in there, they're going to have to put a lot of oxygen into that treatment system, a lot of air, they're going to have to aerate it, bubble it up, and they're going to have to spend significant time for the bugs, the bacteria and the protozoa and all of those to actually eat up the, the materials, okay? Biological oxygen demand. And we'll look right at the end of the, the presentation, very sophisticated uh, labs at these treatment plants, right? Victor Valley just recently shut theirs down and they now outsource it, but still, that's a great job, a great chemistry job is working in those labs. Chemistry, biological job, okay? Suspended solids, the quantity of solid materials floating in the water column. BOD is biochemical oxygen demand. So let's just define that. A measure of the amount of oxygen required to aerobically decompose organic matter in the water. Okay, so this is really, really key here. Um, we do get to septic tanks a little bit later. But uh, in fact, we, I think we actually got to it in the first, in the first lecture that we did on water pollution, water quality, but aerobic and anaerobic. Aerobic simply means there's oxygen. And so there's a whole class of bacteria and protozoa and uh, biotic material that works with oxygen. 
There's another whole group that works anaerobically. They can work with very little oxygen or anaerobically. That's the crowd that doesn't do as good a job. It's not as efficient, doesn't work as well. And that's where you get your tremendous smells and stinks and all of that. Once you start getting to the sewage treatment plant, it'll be a bit smelly up front. But by the end of it, there's this crazy kind of sweet smell. It's not the greatest sweet smell, but there's a sweet smell. That's when all the aerobic digestion is going on. Septic tanks are anaerobic, right? They're in a tank. How does the oxygen get in there? No, it doesn't. So that stuff doesn't do a really good job. And that's a major problem for our watershed because we have large areas that are still on septic tanks. That water ultimately has to get treated by the, by the sediments, by the soil and the sand and all that, as it filters down to the groundwater. If those septic tanks are too close to the groundwater, groundwater, the, the, uh, the, the water table is too high, level of the groundwater, that contaminated water is not properly treated before it hits the groundwater. And we believe that this is why in places like Hinkley, for example, where they have issues with nitrates, right? Blue baby disease, we've talked about this already. Uh, physiological, psychological issues with too much nitrates in groundwater for people. Um, it's, a, it's a major contaminant, right? And we've got to keep it out of the water as much as possible. They believe, and I believe, that a lot of that nitrates that they're worried about in Hinkley, Barstow, aren't as much coming from the dairies, but are historical and coming from way up steam, stream from septic tanks. And so I'm personally, one of my little ventures in life is working, trying to work with the people at the water board, at the Lahutten region of the water board that controls all this to get some focus on that, get some good science on that so that Yes, we, we, we have the dairies do the right thing, but don't penalize them for stuff that they're not doing. With the idea that if we don't penalize them, they'll have more money to put into the technology to treat their waste properly. And we'll see some of that waste treatment that they do, right, um, on how they do it. They actually put it out on alfalfa fields. Let, it's bioremediation. They let the plants fix all of that. All right, so um, this, this idea of aerobic and anaerobic is a big deal, okay? We'll also come across this in, in composting. A compost pile that's not turned often enough to get the oxygen in there, get the air, which is where the oxygen comes from, right, will be a problem because um, it'll start to smell. It won't work well. And so people will complain, well, you got flies and you got smell from a compost pile. Should never happen. Compost piles can be just fantastically sweet. They smell, if you've ever dug up good soil on a moist, after a rain, that really rich, beautiful smell. That's what a compost pile should smell like. It, if it's anaerobic, no, bacteria, no, no oxygen, then it starts to stink, okay? So this aerobic, anaerobic part of these ecosystems we're talking about, both of them are ecosystems, but we always want the aerobic one, okay? Uh, measurement of suspended solids um, tells you and predicts the effectiveness of their treatment. This is how they manage how to, to treat it. So when we get there, if we, we get a chance, we'll notice you'll get there and you'll see big septic trucks that come, you know, um, uh, stink boys or whatever they call it. They've come and they've brought raw sewage from from the uh, toilets that are at an event or they're bringing actually pump from septic tanks. You know, septic tanks have to be pumped every once in a while, every multiple years. They bring it in, they let that in very slowly because it can throw the whole balance of the ecosystem off because of this BOD that comes from the, the septic, the sewage, uh, the septic tank sewage, right? And if also what's coming in, depending on how how rich in, in nutrients it is. It, that's how they manage how quickly they let water into the system, and how quickly they pass it through the system, okay? How quickly the sewage moves down through the system. Very, very complicated process. Um, 
controlled by, by a lot of chemistry, a lot of science, and then a system called SCADA, System Control and da Data Analysis. Uh, system, SCADA, turns pumps on, turns pumps off, turns valves on, turns valves off, based on this information on, on what's going on and whether the ecosystem is healthy. They actually monitor what kinds of bugs are are thriving, if they start seeing some of the bugs thriving that are not the desirable, the anaerobics, then they have to back off um, in how much, how quickly they've moved the system through, okay? Primary treatment is a physical process, okay? We're taking, screening the stuff off. We're letting gravity settle out these solids. Um, here's an example of one of those. This is called a clarifier, the whole system. Um, basically, it just has these these bars here that rotate around like a big food mixer, right? Mixes it all around and stuff sinks out and clarifies and eventually goes to sludge treatment. You'll see at VVWRA, they have a big dome. They, they, they aerobically digest those solids. So this is, a, this is now the solids, not the, the liquid that they're digesting. And then that goes to composting, anaerobic digestion, fertilizers and methane. Now, Really cool thing about this is why these systems are so sustainable, they actually can even produce their own power. So methane is similar formula, CH4, to propane. And they actually run their big pumps. Well, what do they need pumps for? They need pumps to suck a bunch of air and, and pump it into these tanks that we're going to look at in a moment for the secondary process to keep it oxygenated, okay? Okay. And VVWRA is one of two, three, I think, um, off the grid. In other words, means they don't use any outside energy for their system. They are, they are carbon neutral. In other words, they don't use fossil fuels because they're making their own fuel right here by digesting that sludge, okay? Which then the remaining part goes to fertilizer. All right, so that's what the ponds look like. Um, you get to walk around in those. It uh, goes to a sludge thickener and then goes to the settling ponds, and we just saw all of that. Um, now the cool part, the secondary treatment. This is the aerobic, this is biological, okay? This is where all these bugs go to work, okay? And it's called a trickling filter because the bugs aren't actually in the water as much as they're on big surface plates and the bugs are lying there and the water's going by and they're basically digesting. They're decomposers, right? These are decomposing bugs that are eating up all that stuff. But they need oxygen to live on. Remember, if we have a pollution issue on a, on a lake, we have that, uh, that oxygen demands curve where the oxygen demand goes way down because those bugs suddenly flourish there and the fish can die because they don't get enough oxygen. If you remember that oxygen demand curve we looked at in the first one of the first lectures. Okay, So here we are, the whole secondary treatment. Um, very, very simple uh, process. Here's the water coming in. Here's the, the activated uh, sludge, I mean activa act aeration tank. Here's the, the forced air coming in, bubbling up through here. Um, and this is where the action happens. That's where this ecosystem is decomposing all this stuff, right? And then ultimately it goes out to another one of these settling ponds because these bugs also are, are uh, organic matter. When they die, their bodies, as it were, have to go back to the sludge, have to go back to the composting and the methane production. The rest of the water goes on through, through the system, right? Um, and so that's the, the aeration part of it. That's where the, this is the, this is like the ruminant stomach. This is the, 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 the decomposing, the, the fermentation. It really is fermentation chamber happening right here eating up all these nutrients, which are our waste that, that we produced, okay? It's a biological process. <clears throat> it does not filter the water. It actually treats it. The bugs eat up the bad stuff. Um, water runs over a plastic media. I have a friend in South Africa who's 
has a patented process where he puts one of these inside one of those plastic water tanks. And hopefully we'll see something like that over here pretty soon. Um, uh, the treatment on trickling fill. The final clarifiers are another set of primary sedimentation tanks. When, when they've done the process, the bugs actually die naturally. They've got a short life cycle. That goes to sludge, which goes back to the uh, ultimate biosolids, the hard stuff that's going to go out for composting. Okay. All right, that's what, what those tanks look like. Those are, that's actually a clarifying tank, rotating around slowly, letting the solids fall out. The fresh water, the, the partially treated water goes off the top. Okay. Disposal of sludge and biosolids, you've got to treat it. They'll, they'll treat it with lime to sanitize it. Um, and it's applied by injection onto agricultural field. Yeah, irrigation, that's what they're talking about. I don't quite know what they mean by injection. It can either be applied that way, or it can, the actual hard stuff, the solids, gets mixed with compost and applied. Okay? Um, used to be uh, uh, the biosolids were either incinerated or sent to landfills. Neither one of those are allowed anymore. Incineration causes a lot of air pollution. Land disposal causes a lot of methane issues. And both of those are highly regulated now. So all over the state of California now, we have a huge problem with dis disposing of all these biological solids. Lawn clippings, uh, tree trimmings, food waste, which is 50% of what we call our green waste, all the living waste, basically. Um, huge problem. We've got people right now dumping it out in Lucerne Valley on land and we're at the Resource Conservation District where I volunteer. We're actually trying to come up with an ordinance to stop that because it ruins the land, it actually kills the land. Um, not a long story, but it does. Okay, here's the lab. Very active. Um, great place to work. I'm sad that we don't get to see that anymore at VVWRA. Because you could go in there and see these bugs. I remember one was called the teddy bear. Just a really cute looking bug. That was a good bug. Okay, uh, wastewater treatment. What do they look for in, in, these, in these labs? They want to look for the amount of suspended solids. That's how much work they need to do to clean it up. Biological oxygen bond. Talked about that. pH, temperature, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Okay. So this is nitrates, this is phosphorus. Phosphorus is a big problem. Where does the phosphorus, a lot of it come from at a sewage treatment plant? It actually comes from our soaps. Our soaps are very phosphate based and phosphate rich. And so the so soaps are high in phosphorus. We got some years ago for our native plants, some biosolid compost, and it killed them stone dead. I'll never forget, within a week we were like, what the heck happened? And of course, I was the smart guy that had decided this was a good idea, even though I'm not really the horticulture person here. And I, so I, I caught a bit of slack for that. Okay. They also send them out for heavy metals, things like lead, very toxic stuff. Priority pollutants would be things like chromium-6, arsenic, and then wet, which is whole effluent toxicity, is the effluent that's going out in either back into the river or in the biosolid, is it toxic, right? because we can't afford to have it toxic in any way if we're going to reuse it, okay? Who go governs wastewater treatment? Well, government agencies, the U EPA, the US EPA, then the California EPA that's below that, and then regionally, we have the Lahotan, this is really important for you guys to know, Lahotan Regional Water Board, right? The state water board, is divided up into regions and we're in the Lahotan. It's the biggest one, stretches from us and needles all the way up the backside of the mountains of the Eastern Sierras up to Lake Tahoe. It's a very big re region and that's it, the Lahotan Regional Water Con Quality Control Board. On the field trip the other day out to Earl Graham's ranch out there at Summit Valley, at Silverwood, that's who we were talking about. Lahotan is the folks that are control. I just got, they're just going to develop a student project. Anyone listening to this that's interested? 
we need some students. We're going to do a project on, on the sustainable practices out there that are contributing to the ability for that nitrate-rich water, right, that, that secondary effluent that's coming from Crestline into the top of our water supply there in Summit Valley. We're going to do a project on what's happening, what, what is really happening with that, what are the sustainable practices in terms of grazing management, running those cattle, how, what's going on up there to where that's actually a positive, okay? And uh, they're actually going to pay the college to do that. So I'm pretty excited. I just found out about that last night. So it's going to be an applied research project, kind of stuff that people would do for the PhD kind of level stuff. We won't be doing it that sophisticated, but great stuff to have on your resume. Okay, what is gray water? Okay, changing gears here now. Um, same area, gray water. So it's a really smart thing you can do. You familiar if you've ever owned a trailer or a motorhome, you have a black water tank for your for your your toilet stuff, and then you have a gray water tank for everything else. And when you go to empty those out, there's two different outlets. Okay. So gray water is laundry, kitchen, sinks, baths, and showers. That's technically not correct. Kitchen, because of all the solids and food waste, uh, should actually go into your into your black water or your septic. But the rest of it can be recycled, okay? And that's what that little graphic is showing there. And I'm just going to go through this really quickly. This is a great project for somebody to get into this. What's going on with gray water? What is gray water? Um, but we're just going to quickly go through this in a pictorial way here, okay? We, there is a water code section 461 that allows you to reuse gray water. This has been a, a controversial issue for quite a while. Not so much right now, but in the past been very controversial. Um, you know, even to the extent that when I was building my house, my off the grid green home sustainable design, I was even told flat out, no, you can't do gray water. You're not allowed to do that. It has to go in your septic tank. Well, I knew better because in this class, actually, in the years past, we had a gray water expert come in and talk about what you can and can't do with gray water in San Bernardino County. Historically, all the old timers, the desert rats, always did this, right? On my other house, I took the gray water and just took it straight out into, into, onto my plants. Um, works perfectly, it's not dangerous, there's no problem, it's just your shower water, what's that gonna hurt? Um, but they want to be careful with that. They don't want the wrong stuff getting out there. So there are regulations. You're supposed to put it six inches under the ground in a basic little sewerage perforated pipe, um, things like that. And you're supposed to filter it a little bit just to get the solids off. I just built a plastic sump at my house and I got it permitted. You can get it permitted when you build a new house. And now they're actually encouraging this because, again, we need to recycle water as much as possible. It's our most critical resource. I think we spoke about Cape Town in the city of South Africa, being in the country of South Africa, a city in, in the country of South Africa, and how desperate they are. It's, it's decimating their economy that they're running out of water. When you think of it, the, it's the thing. Economy has to have water. We have to have water. Um, so when you don't have it, everything falls apart. So VVWRA, talked about them, Victor Valley Wastewater Reclam Reclamation Authority supported another group that I belonged to and was, was involved in when they first started, AWAC, which is the Alliance of Water Awareness and Conservation. It's a group of all the water districts up here that work on water conservation issues and education and they came forward with a resolution trying to promote gray water use uh, about eight years ago now. Okay? And so this is how these things work. We've got to develop a resolution. You've got to develop a policy. Then we've got to educate. And that's where you know, I'm pretty passionate about getting the word out. We've got to educate people that, hey, no, you can do gray water. You might have to get a permit for it, but it's, it's kind of cool, kind of fun. And uh, again, be a great, uh, if you're interested in this, this would be a great thing to do your final student research project on. Okay, what is a gray water system? Very simple. 
Okay, washing machine, shower, bath, into a gray water system, simple as a sump with a plastic screen on top. I mean, not a plastic screen, a wire screen on top. Pick up all the big stuff and then straight out on the plants, right? If you do it right, you're supposed to go underground and, and have some perforated pipe. Um, gray water sources, here's a soil box planter. This is bioremediation going on, by the way, cleaning up that gray water. When the water comes out the bottom of this, it's going to be pretty clean because the, all those organisms in the soil have, have started to decompose and digest whatever there was in there, right? Here's one. I like this one. They're basically taking the, the sink water and growing a plant right on top of it there, but they're also using it to flush the toilets. So lots of places in the world, there's a whole hotel system that my friend uses his system on where they flush all the toilets with gray water. So you shower over here, it goes in a big bin downstairs, and when you flush the toilet, you're using gray water. Okay? It's really, really not hard to do. Just gray water is, is legal to use in California. California promotes its use, many methods of collecting it, many uses for gray water. Gray water is sustainable. Okay, another important sustainable practice that is coming to the fore and really important is rainwater collection. I hope in the next two days we get good, good uh, rains. Surface areas of roofs, for example, house roofs can collect a huge amount of water in a short amount of time. We have one on our, our lower greenhouse here, it goes into a big tank and then we have a sump pump getting ready to fire that back up. Um, but of course, last five years of drought, six years of drought, you need rain. But anyway, here you can collect it off the rooftop. Here they're collecting it into a drum. Really, really, really simple stuff. Okay, um, just a simple filter up here on the rain. And everyone says, well, isn't it dirty when it comes off your roof? Yeah, maybe the very first time. But remember, rainwater is has evaporated and it's already filtered. So rainwater actually, in essence, is about as pure as it gets. It's often when you pull from surface water that you, you're going to be a little more contaminated, right? Um, there's some more systems. This is actually a person's hand sticking out of that tank, that uh, big thousand gallon storage tank. Um, he has some different systems. He has one in Africa. Just know that our ancestors, especially in dry regions, all had these kinds of rainwater collection systems and cisterns under the ground to collect rainwater. My wife's dad still does that. He has, he has buckets and, and drums all over the corners of the house collecting the rainwater. They just were wired that way. We just got lazy. Um, some really cool ways of storing water. He has an underground cistern. Uh, this is some kind of little tank. I love these. You can get them really cheap from military surface, but these are the way they do it in military installations. It's a big bag that you can store water in. Um, here's just looking at what, how much rainwater is captured in different cities and actually doing the math and showing how much money can be saved and by capturing rainwater rather than, in our case here in Southern California, bringing it 440 miles and all that energy and all that effort and all that money. Okay, um, This is just a little graphic. You'll have to see this on your own. You guys have got good eyes. You can see it of all the ways and places and parts to rainwater harvesting system. I would like to have it on my house. I'm embarrassed to tell you that I don't yet. It's most of the problem is I'm scared of heights and I don't want to get up on a two-story house to put in the gutter. So if anybody is not scared of heights, let me know and I've got a really cool job for you. All right, um, political and social aspects, a lot of stuff again comes down to myths and misunderstandings. Rainwater capture, big story about how there have been some highly publicized stories of some people in municipalities getting charged prosecuted because they had rainwater capture systems. Not really real, but me they make good media stories. They, they are real, they happened, but the general feeling and the policy now, um, there's actual uh, assembly bills that, 
that promote and allow rainwater harvesting, right? But there were just early days, a few years ago, some, some cases of people getting um, prosecuted for doing rainwater collection. So the Water for 2060 Act is one of them in Oklahoma, for example. Okay, conclusion, rainwater harvesting is really cool and it's going to take some time and some push and shove and that's where Again, I'm really passionate about people learning that, yes, there's positives and this could be, there could be negatives. If, if you collected contaminated rainwater, not really sure how often that would happen, but maybe it ran off through, um, I don't know, some kind of contaminated area, then you need, to, you need to have some regulations in place. I'm not saying we shouldn't have regulations, but... In most cases, the regulations are there. It's just a matter of people taking responsibility and saying, oh, that sounds like a cool idea. Why don't I try that? All right, so that's it for today. Thank you very much. Take care.